On January 12, 2021, the Malaysian King, Sultan Abdullah Ahmad Shah, declared a nationwide state of emergency. The announcement was made following a sharp rise in the number of new daily coronavirus infections in the country. This shows how grave the situation is, how serious and how severe the situation is around COVID-19. It is, I think, a very real crisis because it is about to overwhelm uh, this country's stretched healthcare system. Political opponents of Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin, however, argue that the emergency proclamation is but an attempt by Mr Muhyiddin to strengthen his slippery grip on power. Do we have a security problem? How is the public order? How is the security? Anybody threatened? Anybody shooting? Anybody? He uh, wanted a state of emergency, which means that uh, he would still remain Prime Minister despite not having the support of the majority of members of parliament. What is Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin's motive for declaring a state of emergency in the country? Is it an attempt to save the nation from the deadly disease? Or a desperate move to preserve his slipping grip on power? January 2021, Malaysia is in the throes of its second nationwide lockdown. The streets of the capital, Kuala Lumpur, as well as the city's main thoroughfares are quiet yet again as the Movement Control Order, or MCO, comes into full force. Despite all its initial success in containing the COVID-19 pandemic through a decisive lockdown measure last year, Everything has all but fizzled off one year on. All of a sudden, the number of infections hit a new record high in January this year. It saw more than 3,000 daily infections for the first time since the pandemic began a year ago. Since then, the number of cases has been trending upwards, hitting a record peak of more than 5,700 daily cases on January 30th, 2021. This third or second wave that we're seeing, this huge jump in the number of COVID-19 cases, came about after the Sabah state elections in September 2020. It just you know, jumped 20-fold uh, from what was the previously low levels of numbers, and it has not uh, abated yet. And I think so this is a new crisis that has emerged. And it is, I think, a very real crisis because it is about to overwhelm uh, this country's stretched healthcare system. On January 11th, 2021, the Malaysian government announced a second round of nationwide lockdown to help curb the soaring number of coronavirus cases in the country. The next day, the king declared a state of emergency on the advice of the Prime Minister and it's scheduled to last until August this year. Mr Muhyiddin's party information chief, Wan Zaifu Wan Jan, also stressed that the action was done in accordance with the constitutional provisions of the country. Prime Minister even spoke about in his speech uh, the concerns about uh, the, the strain being put on our healthcare system and all this require uh, you know, stronger measures to be taken. And I think the provision is quite clear in the constitution. It was recommendation by the cabinet supported by all the key players within the government structure, within the civil service. The emergency uh, declaration is really focused on our fight against uh, COVID-19, right? So, uh, so the focus uh, today for this government is really looking at the, you know, the emergency ordinance is to focus on public health care uh, and, like I said, to fight COVID-19. Um, so we want to allow uh, the nation to continue uh, and we've been talking about economy, so we want to secure its uh, economic recovery path. But the declaration of the emergency law and the imposition of the lockdown measures have hit the struggling economy and businesses hard. 
Mondekaria is an intimate, no-frills bar and a live music venue. Located in Petaling Jaya, a suburb in Greater Kuala Lumpur, the area was once abuzz with activities. Co-founders of Mondekaria, musician and author Brian Gomez and his wife Melanie Delican, say that the establishment even became the epicenter for the local art scene in Malaysia for the last seven years. But everything fell into pieces when the pandemic hit. It was a good year. 2019 it was a good year for the world. It was really good for us. It was. It looked like we were, you know, getting closer, much closer to our end goal. And in March, when this happened, March 18th, we just shut. We actually just shut our doors for the start because we didn't know what to do, right? Brian and Melanie, however, bootstrapped their way to keep their passion project going. Musicians were even busking on stage every night to help them maintain a regular income following the relaxation of the first MCO in May last year. And then, another round of lockdown came into force, followed by the declaration of the state of emergency in January this year. That forced them to shut their business once again. There was no re recouping of, uh, of money from the, the income that was lost. Business was still really, really bad. And I, I uh, expect that it's the same uh, for many, many businesses. An emergency law was first declared in the country in September 1964. That happened during the confrontation between Indonesia and Malaysia. The second time a nationwide state of emergency was invoked was during the May 13, 1969 racial riots. A curfew was declared and parliament was suspended for nearly two years. The question is, does a pandemic warrant the declaration of another state of emergency in the country? Unfortunately, unlike the situation in the past during the confrontation with Indonesia or the emergency involving uh, the insurgency, uh, the situation right now, in many ways, it's more problematic and uh, much harder to contain because it is a pandemic. It's a virus that's uh, spreading throughout the community uh, and is ravaging the economy. Uh, so it presents a new threat that is unconventional uh, in the way that this country has uh, encountered prior to this. So you have a situation where the government is, I think, looking at what powers it has, what means it has in order to contain the pandemic and also to um, uh, encourage stability. But politics also played a part in Prime Minister Muhyiddin's decision to declare a state of emergency in the country. That's the view of all opposition parties, including former Prime Minister and leader of Pejuang, Dr Mahathir Mohamad. The government already has power to do everything that it wishes to do uh, with regard to curbing the spread of the uh, virus. Uh, there is no need for any uh, emergency powers or any um, uh, um, overcoming any laws uh, in the country. I think the second attempt to call for emergency is driven by fear because if we look at the timing, um, on the 11th of January, the government announced Movement Control Order 2.0. One day later, uh, they announced the emergency. And that was the very same day on the 12th of January that Nasri, one of the UMNO MPs, he was supposed to do a press conference in the afternoon, uh, calling for uh, notifying the public about his withdrawal, his support for Perikatan National Government. So if you look at the timing, I think it is motivated or driven uh, by or dictated, I think, by what AMNO was going to do to Perikatan National. The announcement also came barely a week after AMNO divisions had overwhelmingly decided to cut ties with the smaller party in the ruling coalition, Bersatu, led by Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin. Well, if you look at the timing, it's, uh, it, it looks political. Uh, it, it came at a time when the uh, major party in the ruling coalition 
uh, is trying to review its relationship uh, with the ruling coalition. Uh, so yes, uh, from that perspective, uh, it's uh, it looks like it's politically mot motivated, and the perception is that the emergency was uh, declaration was made to stop Amno uh, from taking on the ruling party. And just days before the emergency announcement, two Amno MPs publicly withdrew their support for Mr. Muhyiddin as the Prime Minister. With the backing of only 109 MPs, the government led by Mr. Muhyiddin was put in a politically precarious position. And by convention, Mr. Muhyiddin has already lost the majority support in Parliament. But why did Amno decide to go against the Prime Minister, even though it's part of the ruling coalition? Deputy Amno Chief in Johor, Nur Jasla Muhammad, has alluded to the fact that Amno being the largest party in the ruling coalition, no longer wants to play second fiddle to Basatu. It also doesn't want Amno to be associated with an unstable coalition, which only has a very slim majority in parliament. For nearly one year now, it has been trying to prove its majority in parliament. And the uh, number that has always come up with is two, a majority of two. This government is very unstable. This government is uh, prone to uh, failure. And therefore, uh, we, uh, AMNO also is worried that in the longer term, that if we are uh, tied up with this government, uh, which is unstable, which, is, which doesn't have the majority at the moment, we also might lose our support uh, in, uh, in terms of the public. The same sentiment is also shared by AMNO's Supreme Council member, Tajuddin Abdurrahman. AMNO has sacrificed a lot in the sense that we forgo our right, for example, to uh, form the government or to lead the government. By right, we deserve to lead the party, the government, because we have more numbers of member of parliament. Bersatu, however, says that the views expressed by some members of the party may not necessarily reflect AMNO's official position. It's important to, to uh, understand that AMNO as a party the official stand at the moment is to remain within the Perikatan National Government. Uh, the decision of AMNO as a party is to remain supporting Tan Sri Muhyiddin as a Prime Minister. A few individuals within the party may have made statements here and there, but a few people do not make a party. But the reality is, all's not well with the Perikatan National and Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin. He's now leading a minority government and its largest component party, UMNO, has threatened to pull out of the coalition unless an election is called soon. It's quite clear that some elements within UMNO uh, you know, wants to get back into power and wants to have fresh elections. Uh, and I think there is recognition on that on the part of Mohidin, that he knows that uh, this is coming. So we know that the political conditions are unstable and that the government's uh, position could fall at any point in time. But is Mr. Muhyiddin taking a big risk by imposing a state of emergency in the country? Or is it a shrewd move that would help guarantee his political survival in the face of the continuous onslaught from his opponents? It's been almost two months since a state of emergency was declared in the country. The government has now shifted its coronavirus fight into higher gear in its efforts to try and tackle the surging infections. Politics has taken a backseat for now. In fact, the emergency decree has effectively put a lid on a political rebellion which had threatened to destabilize and topple the one-year-old leadership of Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin. Parliament, too, has been suspended, making it virtually impossible for his political opponents to push through a motion of no confidence against the Prime Minister. Amno's plan to unseat him from power through a snap election has now been scuttled. 
Well, uh, he can check me. How long can he check me? How long? Check me by using emergency? How long the emergency? Cannot be two to three years. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Sooner or later, the emergency will be lifted. Maybe two months, maybe three months. So once it's lifted, what's going to happen? No, we are back to normal life. And there is parliament sitting. And when parliament sitting, then we have to cover the boat. You know, oh, who has the majority? Who has the command of the house? Like a house of cards, Mr. Muyidin's position has become increasingly tenuous. In fact, two UMNO MPs withdrew their support for him. That means, at the time the emergency was announced, Mr. Muyidin only had 109 MPs backing him in the 222-member lower house. UMNO is not part of the national. Politically, UMNO has made, it, made a stand, political a decision and a stand very clearly. We are not going to be with Bosatu in the next election. We are RU15. We are not going to be together. Other opposition parties have also jumped into the fray, despite having very little room to maneuver during the emergency period. Many have questioned the need for an emergency rule to fight the pandemic. Opposition leader Anwar Ibrahim has written an appeal letter to the king, requesting his assent to end the state of emergency in the country. He claims that Mr. Muyidin is in no position to advise the king, as he no longer commands the majority support among federal lawmakers. So, effectively, the Perikatan government is a minority government. It is a government that do not have more than half of the uh, what is it called parliament support. But that doesn't mean that the government uh, has fallen. Uh, it's, um, the question now is, what we are questioning is, it's not so much whether the government is still there. The question is whether we should confer a government that have no majority such a vast power that it could prompt to abuse and um, prompt to be described as a dictatorship. Last year, we flattened the curve despite not having an emergency. And uh, so we feel that the emergency can do, we can do without the emergency. There are sufficient powers using the existing uh, movement control order to control the number of COVID cases. Now, number two, um, we also were told by the government that in February this year, we would receive our vaccine and, and and therefore when you already have a plan to introduce vaccine but at the same time you introduce an emergency up to August. Basatu's information chief, Wan Zaifu Wan Jan, however, feels that politics aside, the government has to make a firm decision in response to the pandemic, however unpopular it may be. Some people was arguing that uh, a movement control order would be necessary, but the reality is we have seen how it's not enough. Uh, you know, more powers are needed to make sure that certain controls can be put into place. There are concerns about the Prime Minister even spoke about in his speech, the concerns about uh, the strain being put on our healthcare system, and all this require uh, you know, stronger measures to be taken. Sometimes when the government uh, needs to make a decision, it's not always a popular one, but it's needed to make sure that the country can, can progress and, and take a step forward. It is a little bit about politics, but I think it's at the end a goal of trying to achieve some stability, some certainty in an otherwise uh, critical period in the country's uh, history. And so the intention to have this uh, emergency it's not just because of politics or that COVID has provided a cover for him to prolong his stay in power, uh, but rather it's a practical attempt to try and stabilise the situation before uh, the mandate can be uh, regained from the public. That, that's how I see it. As COVID numbers rose to more than 5,000 daily, lockdown-weary Malaysians have become increasingly jittery angry and frustrated. Collective fatigue with lockdown regulations has set in. 
public approval for Mr. Muidin's government has also fallen. According to a survey conducted by EMIR Research at the end of last year, only 35% of the respondents saw Mr. Muidin's government as viable, down from 43% in August last year. We need a strong government to lead us out of this problem. An emergency won't help. In fact, we are the only country in the world that uses emergency, nationwide emergency, to basically uh, solve the COVID issue as a reason, but suspends the parliament. So the consequences of suspending the parliament too, you know, uh, might cascade to how the people will react when the general election is called. Usually, governments that use emergency will, be, uh, will face a backlash from the uh, voters after the emergency is lifted. If there is any abuse of power, uh, if there's any wrongdoings uh, during this period of emergency, I'm sure the people will punish us for those wrongdoings. And uh, I think, the, uh, you know, if you look at the current situation, people are still living their daily life as usual. People are still talking about how to you know, uh, continue with the economic activities. Uh, in fact, there's so many people still continuing to do all the charitable and welfare activities helping uh, each other. So life continues as normal. As we get through, as we get uh, through this period of emergency in the next few weeks, uh, I, I think all the criticisms will start to subside because people will realise that this is being done for the good of the nation, for the good of, of the people and the benefit will be seen uh, gradually as time goes by. I warn him that AMNO is going to be the strongest party in his coalition and he's going to have trouble with AMNO. And now we can see that this is his problem. He is never very sure about his uh, 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 majority position. He's always being hampered by uh, demands being made by AMNO. It's been more than a month since the emergency law was enforced to combat the spread of COVID-19. But the end is still not yet in sight. The number of daily coronavirus cases remains above 2,000, while the death toll has crossed the 1,000 mark. The impact on the economy has also been equally severe. Malaysia's economy posted the biggest annual decline since the 1998 Asian financial crisis. According to the official figures released in May last year, 3.9% or 600,000 people are unemployed, the highest in almost a decade. Will Mr. Muhyiddin suffer the impact of the economic fallout? It was his lifelong dream to be a pilot. In fact, 45-year-old Azrin Muhammad Zawawi lived out his best life, soaring above the clouds in commercial airlines for the past 20 years. But he did not expect it to end so soon. When this uh, COVID, uh, pandemic, uh, COVID-19 uh, started uh, last year, I think uh, March last year, and then uh, I, I saw uh, from uh, company, uh, my, com my company performance, they start reducing the flights. So I, uh, that time, I already uh, think uh, that I must do something. That is something is not right. Azrin's worst fear, however, came true. He was asked to pack his bags on November 1st last year. The COVID-19 pandemic devastated the entire airline business. It shattered his dream as well. Instead of allowing himself to wallow in self-pity, he and his wife decided to open up a small business to help bring in some income. He set up a roadside store, aptly named Captain Corner in October, selling Northern Malay cuisines. The idea came from my uh, lovely wife. So 
So uh, I'm so lucky because my family's, uh, uh, my wife fa family, they are so good with uh, uh, cooking. They have uh, 30 years experience in uh, cooking. So I just proceed uh, uh, the business according to uh, whatever we have uh, from from my wife family. The revenue or income from this business is not as much as uh, what I received during my flying days. But uh, it's good enough uh, to survive, especially during this uh, pandemic. Because uh, with uh, income that I have now, I, can, uh, I still can pay my loans and uh, can support my family. When international borders were shut early last year, the airline industry was among the first to take a hit. The sector suffered huge losses amid the sudden industry meltdown. In Malaysia alone, the industry suffered nearly $4 billion loss in revenue. Thousands of people were laid off as a result. Azrin, however, considers himself lucky. He was reinstated late last year. But he only flies two to three times a month, earning a lot less than he used to. So his main income now comes from the Captain Corner food store. The amount of people affected by, uh, by this COVID-19 uh, is keep on increasing every day. I think they, uh, they have no choice. They have to do a second MCO just to flatten the the uh, disease and uh, but then again uh, as a Malaysian it's our responsibility to maintain the SOP that that is the most important whatever uh, planned by the government we must support to help shelter the people from the full impact of the lockdown and the pandemic Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin recently unveiled the fifth economic stimulus package worth nearly $4 billion. It includes 22 new initiatives that are meant to put money in people's pockets and to ensure that businesses can still survive during the pandemic. Although the latest initiative will have a positive impact on the economy, many economists feel that it won't be sustainable over the long term, the longer the pandemic continues. Okay, it will be enough to sustain the economy for a while. That is like cash handouts to, to the vulnerable groups, the B40. That will also help them. Even if it doesn't help them for a long period of time, at least it's some cash injections into the economy. As well as whether it's enough or not is a, is a, is a relative question because certain things, it can be enough for a short-term period. So I don't think we are looking at a long-term impact of this stimulus package. I think it's going to be very short-term, but it's necessary. Brian Gomez of Madeka Rea for one is grateful for receiving a government fund called Chandana, which was set up to encourage the growth and development of the local art scene. But he says that the government's latest stimulus package has failed to address the financial problems faced by many business owners like himself. I don't think the latest package is anywhere close to being enough. I don't think the first one was either for, for most uh, businesses. And you, you, you can see that in, in, I mean, just on our row, I think that three, uh, three lots have uh, shut down. Uh, or one restaurant and uh, uh, I think a, a, like a warehouse uh, of, of uh, yeah, machine. Some yeah, manufacturing something. Um, so uh, it, you know, clearly, it's it's not enough. I'm, I'm pretty sure many uh, businesses are going to go under, and uh, especially with the second round. Given the resources we have uh, and the fiscal space that we have today, um, we did. Uh, what we can and what we think is right uh, at this point in time. Uh, and we've shown, uh, even previously in the 20, year 2020, uh, when there is a requirement or there, when there is a need uh, to add more fiscal uh, injection into the economy, we will do it. Uh, but I think we have to do it at the right time uh, and at the right place. Uh, so when we announced the budget 2021, 
uh, the amount was around 322.5 billion ringgit, which is the largest uh, budget we ever ever announced. It doesn't mean uh, that we cannot adjust uh, the budget. Uh, to prioritize on the areas that we want to prioritize. Stimulus package is, is just that, right? It's just, uh, I mean, it's like a, it's like a painkiller, you know? Uh, you cannot take too much painkiller. So uh, I think it may, be, it may provide, you know, temporary, uh, temporary relief to those who are affected badly by the lockdown. But uh, government assistance, uh, cannot be a, a, a long-term a long solution. So there must be a proper action plan, especially post-lockdown, uh, 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 post-pandemic, you know, post-emergency. There must be a clear clear uh, economic recovery plans that can, uh, that can help those who are badly affected by, by these I know, almost 10 months lockdown. The Malaysian economy contracted 5.6% last year, the biggest contraction since the 1997 Asian financial crisis as a result of the pandemic. But the economy is expected to return to positive growth this year, as with other economies around the world, due to sustained progress in vaccine rollouts. Back in November 2020, Malaysia's central bank forecast a GDP growth of 6.5 to 7.5 percent for the year 2021. But according to Moody's analytics, its economic outlook remains at risk due to the movement control order, which is currently being enforced in the country to combat the rise in COVID-19 infections. The longer the movement control order, the higher the risk to GDP numbers. What I see uh, is that th those projections uh, at that point in time was realistic. But now, given the current state of uh, affairs, it is not so realistic. It's going to be a little less than that because we already have a MCO 2.0 in place. We also have a, a political emergency in place. And both of that would have an impact on economic growth. You know, we have already lost 2020. Uh, if we don't act fast and fix these problems as soon as possible this year, we will lose 2021 as well. So in 2020, we lost 5% you know, GDP growth. We can't afford to lose another 5% or even less this year. This year was supposed to be a year of growth and recovery. At this point in time, with a high number of cases, uh, that doesn't look so uh, promising. Despite all of these concerns, Malaysia's finance minister, Tenku Zafru Tenku Abdul Aziz maintains the government's GDP growth between 6.5 and 7.5 percent for 2021 is within reach. It's going to be challenging, uh, if I can be very honest, uh, about the, the projection. Uh, projection that we made obviously was uh, based on assumption that there, there is no MCO um in, in january and the other thing is that mco 2.0 as you know is very different uh, from what we had in march uh, 90 percent of the economic activity is actually still going on uh, in terms of contribution to gdp although we can see that only uh, well, probably half of the workforce is working um, uh, but, and we've seen that in terms of losses um i've shared this before if i'm not mistaken um in the mco 1.0 a uh, total loss per day is close to 2.4 billion ringgit, uh, whereas in this MCO 2.0 uh, that's happening today, it's around 700 uh, million ringgit. Uh, so the impact is less uh, than before. Protecting the lives of its citizens and dealing with an economy that's struggling to find its footing in the midst of lockdown measures and the state of emergency. It's a fine balance that Mr. Muhyiddin has to strike to ensure the nation's continued stability and economic survival. That's also the hope of Malaysians, including Azrin. He's now trying his best to survive under trying circumstances. Yes, I pray every day. I pray every day and hopefully this uh, pandemic will end as soon as possible and we can live like normal and we, we can do whatever we do before and uh, live like a normal days. And uh, hopefully this will come as soon as possible. 
Will the prospect of an economic rebound this year be enough to save Mr. Muhyiddin's political career? Can he stave off the challenges from his political opponents and emerge on top yet again? Or will his political gamble backfire on him? It was back in October last year when Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin first advised the king to declare a state of emergency in the country. That was when Parliament convened to decide the fate of the government's 2021 budget, largely seen as a vote of confidence in Mr Muhyiddin's administration. Although the king rejected the proposal, he called on parliamentarians to support the budget. In January this year, Mr. Muhyiddin again requested for the king to declare a state of emergency. It's at a time when the number of COVID-19 infections soared to alarmingly high levels. This time, the king assented to the request. But the proposal was made at a time when some UMNO members had already withdrawn their support for Mr. Muhyiddin, resulting in the loss of his parliamentary majority. Well, at the time he requested for emergency to be declared, he had already lost the majority to um, make him the government of the country. What he should have done was to submit his resignation because he had lost. But in order to perpetuate himself, to remain prime minister, he uh, wanted a, a state of emergency which means that uh, he would still remain Prime Minister despite not having the support of the majority of members of Parliament. So now he has not only been able to uh, stay on as Prime Minister, but with enhanced powers, powers which can uh, overcome any law that may uh, limit his uh, his capacity to take action. But the concern that the Prime Minister might use his wide-ranging powers for political purposes appears to be unfounded, at least for now. Apart from giving the additional powers to combat the pandemic, the declaration of the state of emergency has not led to any drastic or fundamental change to the status quo. In the previous instances, when emergency rule was declared, it suspended the legislature, but it also uh, removed uh, cabinet leaders and state leaders from their positions of power. Uh, and sometimes it was uh, declared without a particular termination date. So I think for ordinary members of the public, as well as members of civil society, I think they're looking at it with some concern uh, with respect to how will the Prime Minister and his uh, other leaders take the powers that are now available for them. On the other side of the argument, we can see that there are some measures to try and mitigate this concern uh, in the sense that there is an end date, so it will end on the 1st of August. Number two, uh, the state chiefs, chiefs of uh, states, chief ministers and mentries besides all remain in place uh, in the sense that there has not been a usurpation of power by members of the ruling coalition in states that are controlled by the opposition. Third, uh, there has not been any real curtailment of freedoms to express oneself so far. We do not want to do anything wrong or abuse our powers either, being in government. I'm sure Tansi Muhyiddin will be very cautious because as soon as the emergency ends, uh, then he promised to have an election as soon as possible after that. So uh, I'm sure he doesn't want to lose the election either and we don't want to lose the election. As a result of that, of that realisation, we need to do the best that we can to make sure the integrity, the credibility of this government, of this coalition continues. Mr Muhyiddin Yassin was sworn into office as Prime Minister on March 1st, 2020 as the leader of the new Parikata National Government. After the fall of Pakatan Harapan on February 24, 
2020. He was among those who left the then ruling coalition to form an alliance with former political nemesis AMNO and the Islamist party PAS. But barely a year later, his new coalition is facing a similar power struggle which could trigger its collapse. With his majority in parliament hanging in the balance, the emergency rule could certainly help Mr. Muridin buy more time to consolidate his position and plan his next move. The recent move by two MPs from the opposition party, PKR, to pledge support for Mr. Muridin's government, however, has allowed him to, for now, rule with a simple majority. But Amno's Tajuddin Abdurrahman says that Amno will not just sit back and watch the events as they unfold. He says that Amno will push for a general election as soon as the emergency rule is lifted. So if we continue with the emergency, you know, without valid reason or very lame excuse, you think we're going to just sit back and say, okay, we, 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 we just follow along. We are not that stupid. Come on, man. <laughs> we, do not, we know when the time to, to act. We can pull on, like now we already, two member of parliament already withdrawn. You never know how many more will be drawn. If let's say tomorrow we decide, okay, all member of parliament of Amnu has to pull their handbrake. What's going to happen? Tan Sri Muhyiddin will call for an election when he feels Basatu is strongest to win over Amnu and when they manage to sort out seat negotiation between Bersatu, Pas and Amno, looking at how they wrestle Sabah when, um, you know, when the threat of COVID was still there and after the Sabah elections, we all know that the numbers skyrocketed. Uh, so I, I think using COVID as a reason for Perikata National, I don't think it will stand. I think he will call for an election when, when he uh, can sort out his relationship with Amno. And based on what we are seeing now, I don't think they will call for an election anytime now. Without the support of AMNO, which is the biggest party in the coalition, it's hard to imagine if Mr. Muhyiddin can still win big at the next election to form the next government. AMNO has time and time again reiterated that its cooperation with Basatu will end once the election is called. In the next election, we are RU15, we are not going to be together. You know, we like to continue what we have agreed with PAS. We're going to be together with PAS, you know, uh, God willing, you know, we can maintain that uh, PAS and AMNO uh, relationship in the Mopakat National. But uh, in so far as Bersatu is concerned, uh, AMNO has rejected that, you know, to be our partner in the next election. That is our direction. That is the game plan. Well, I, I think it's going to be a uh, free for all general election, so meaning uh, uh, AMNO or Barisan National will go their own way, uh, Bersatu and Perikatan National will likely go their own way, uh, similarly with uh, Pakatan Harapan. Meanwhile, Mr. Muhyiddin's political troubles seem to grow by the day. The truth is, Mr. Muhyiddin has taken a huge risk by declaring a state of emergency. But leader Bersatu, Wan Saifu Wan Jan, feels that his political gamble will pay off in the end. Well, it's definitely a huge gamble in terms of political reputation. Because from someone uh, like Tan Sri Muhyiddin, known as someone who left his previous party, AMNO, to fight kleptocracy, to protest against corruption, to protest against wrongdoing, to champion integrity in the last election, Suddenly, he took this huge step that is very risky to him in terms of his political uh, uh, reputation. It's a big gamble, uh, uh, you know, it definitely is. Uh, but I think by doing this, we can see the, the real character behind Tan Sri Muhyiddin or the real character in Tan Sri Muhyiddin. He is not thinking about, about politics, he's not thinking about himself, he's not thinking about his personal political reputation. 
but he's thinking about what is best for the country as a whole. Malaysia is in the grip of one of its worst political crises since independence. One year after the collapse of Pakatan Harapan government, the political instability has worsened ever since. There's no single party or coalition of parties strong enough to form a formidable majority in parliament, and nobody knows for certain who has the upper hand. I think if we prioritise the country, all efforts should be put the, towards uh, maintaining that coalition and strengthening the coalition rather than weakening it. So all the political parties that want to be part of the Perikata National Government, they need to figure out internally within their own parties. Do they want to prioritise themselves and let the public see how selfish that decision is? Or they want to make some sacrifices like what Bersatu is doing now. Take some risk and say that we're willing to share so that we can work and, and govern the country and lead the country in a peaceful and harmonious way. So uh, it's, it's very risky uh, for any political party today to claim that they have the right uh, to be the most dominant party. The, I think that era has ended. We have supported him. We, we want to, uh, what do you call this, uh, kill him politically or to bring him down. We, we would have done it much earlier. And we should have answered demand for, for Amno to be uh, to lead the new government. Who is power crazy? Who is looking for opposition? Amno or anybody else? As Malaysians try to keep their heads above water to survive the pandemic, political players from all sides are busy planning and figuring out their next move. For Mr. Muhyiddin, the prospect of keeping the current ruling coalition intact looks increasingly uncertain. If anything, the next general election might just be the start of a new round of bitter fights and never-ending political struggles between various parties, both within and outside the ruling coalition. It's a challenge that Prime Minister Muhyiddin Yassin will have to tackle head-on.